Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, and I am honored to welcome back to the National Constitution Center one of my most distinguished predecessors as presidents of the National Constitution Center, Rick Stengel. It is such a thrill to welcome Rick home in addition to his distinguished service here at the NCC. Uh, he was the longest serving Undersecretary of State for Public <laughs> Diplomacy and Public Affairs in American history. And the, the job was created in 1999. So well, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you had a good chunk of that uh, during your time there. Uh, he was the uh, 16th managing editor of Time Magazine and the author of uh, many important books, including a definitive biography that he co-wrote with Nelson Mandela. I can't wait to discuss his new book, but before we do, we have to just go through a few rituals to show Rick how we start shows here um, since he's left. We always begin by reciting the mission of the National Constitution Center to inspire the congregation. So ladies and gentlemen, here we go for, for Rick's benefit. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. Very well done. Thank you, uh, members of the, of the congregation. And now uh, I will <laughs> plug the shows that we have coming up, which are Wonderful. Next week, Eric Foner, the distinguished historian of Reconstruction, will be here to discuss his new book, The Second Founding, How the Civil War Remade the Constitution. After that, uh, on October 27th, uh, the Liberty Medal will be awarded to Justice Anthony Kennedy. And if you're not signed up for that, I would love to see you there. That'll be a very exciting event. Uh, on November 6th, I will launch my new book, Conversations with RBG, which I'm very excited to share with you. And then we're gonna have a wonderful debate about should we have a new constitutional convention with Lawrence Lessig and others. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it <clears throat> is a great uh, pleasure to discuss this fascinating new book, Information Wars, How We Lost the Global Battle Against Disinformation and What We Can Do About It. I'd love to jump right in, Rick, by having you help the, our friends understand what the three disinformation wars that you describe in the book are. You talk about ISIS's disinformation, you talk about Russia's disinformation about Ukraine, and then you talk about disinformation in the election of 2016. Start with ISIS. What was the nature of their disinformation, and why did you find it disturbing on the job? Jeff, thank you. I'm really, really delighted to be back here. I had a wonderful time here. It's a fantastic place. And when I was the CEO, I thought, you know what? I'm just pretending to be a constitutional scholar. Maybe they should get an actual constitutional <laughs> scholar Pardon. to be the head of it. And you've done a fantastic job. And, and I think you've helped realize the mission <laughs> yeah. in a way that us pretenders couldn't actually do. So. Well, what they should do is get, again, a real diplomat. And then you can come back. Well. <laughs> um, so. Yes, so I, I talk about three forms of disinformation that I encountered when I was at the State Department. So the, the job, the uh, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy job, I used to joke it was like being the chief marketing officer for the United States of America. You, you told America's story around the world. It was a, it's a wonderful job, and it's a great thing to be able to do. But one of the things underneath me was something called the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, which was created by someone named Secretary Hillary Clinton, to combat the rise of a terrorist group that was showing all kinds of facility on social media called Al-Qaeda, because they had an imam on the hillside in Pakistan, and they filmed him, they loaded it up to YouTube. Lo and behold, a few years later, ISIS was being born, and this little group, which reported to me, saw them coming. And it was kind of a revelation. The book starts with two events that happened right around the same time. The, uh, the first beheading by ISIS of that uh, uh, lovely ABC journalist and the annexation of Crimea by Russia. So what I saw was ISIS weaponizing information in the same way that I then saw the Russians weaponizing information. I called it in the book the weaponization of grievance. 
because ISIS represented this idea that Sunni Muslims felt left out by the modern world. They, they felt abused by their leaders. And by the way, they had very good reasons to, to feel that way. And ISIS weaponized that grievance and turned it into a kind of a murderous ideology with, and, and using social media in a way that a terrorist group never had. The Russians also weaponized grievance. This is what Putin did, because the Russians felt left out by the modern world. I actually interviewed Putin in, in 2007 when I was editor of Time. And that, in that interview was the interview where he said, the greatest tragedy of the 20th century was the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Hmm. So his whole goal, in a way, is to kind of put the band back together. And what he did was, in his quest for power, and then when he consolidated power, he weaponized the grievance and unhappiness of Russians who felt like, wow, when we were the Soviet Union, we were a world superpower, and now we're just a kind of a local country that you know, makes vodka. And so that was what he did. And come to Donald Trump, who weaponized the grievance of Americans who felt left out by globalization and industrialization. And they all had the same motto. ISIS's motto basically was make Islam great again. Putin's motto was make Russia great again. And that guy in the White House had a similar motto, doesn't he? Um, so that was the through line that I saw. And the, the story tells how you know, nobody really saw the rise of Donald Trump. And in a weird way, Donald Trump connected these two battles against disinformation by becoming this kind of center of disinformation, not only in America, but around the world, and which we see every day. Wow, uh, extraordinary confluence of those three events. Just to help us understand the geopolitics of what's going on now, um, is there a more granular connection between uh, uh, Ukraine, Turkey, and ISIS? Sort of help us decide well, the connections there, which um, are complicated and not intuitively obvious. Well, there is. I mean, it, it's, it's in a weird way, um, in, a, in a sort of tragic way. I mean, the book actually starts in Ukraine with the, uh, the protests in the Maidan in, in, in 2013 and 2014 that you know, this corrupt guy, Yanukovych, was leading it. And the person who worked for him, of course, was Paul Manafort. Um, so that, that created this need for Russia to annex Crimea which, which created this, which then they created the Internet Research Agency, which created this tsunami of disinformation. So part of my thesis is that what we saw, and I went to Ukraine three times when I was in the State Department, to combat Russian disinformation around the annexation of Crimea, which is the southernmost part of Ukraine, where Putin said, it's always been a part of Russia. We didn't annex it. It really wants to be Russian. He denied that there were Russian troops there. And then we started seeing all of this social media, mainly on Twitter, about you know, the US is the cause of this rebellion, uh, echoing Putin's lies, the Nazis running the protests, Hillary Clinton is behind the whole thing. And we saw this, and it's like, what do we do about this? Now, it happened to have been in Russian and Ukrainian and local languages. But as I tell the story, what I realized in, in 2015 and 2016 is they took that same operation and they brought it over here. And it was way more successful than they ever imagined it would be. And they just started doing it in English. And by the way, terrible English. English you know, with grammatical mistakes and spelling errors. And, and, but you know what? That didn't matter because the people they were trying to reach weren't aware of it. It's like, when I was trying to figure this out, I had a marketing guy say to me, you know the email you get from the Nigerian prince who's in jail? And, he, and, and the guy says, you know, it's filled with spelling errors and grammatical mistakes. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, you know, that's deliberate. I said, why? He said, because if you answer that email and you believe that he's a Nigerian prince and you don't care about the spelling errors and the grammar, they know they have a live wire. So that, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mechanism to, to sort out people who wouldn't be receptive to it. In a weird way, I don't think the Russians did that deliberately, but it had the same effect. Because, by the way, if you're willing to believe that Hillary Clinton is running a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor in Washington, you don't really care about the Oxford comma. <laughs> and that's a tragedy. Um, <laughs> you Describe, it's so dramatic how you came to state and you became 
convinced of the magnitude of the problem and you were struck by the fact that others around you didn't appreciate it. And you got a call early on from former Secretary Hillary Clinton who said, this is really serious, you gotta do something. Yes, so, um, you know, it's funny. I had seen her, so when I, I, I was always a big admirer of her and I did a uh, cover story on her when I was editor of Time called Smart Power and I actually traveled with her to, on a trip to um, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq and Libya. Um, and when I came here, it was, must have been a Liberty Medal ceremony in 2013 um, when I started, she got the Liberty yes. Medal. Yes. So, I had already accepted this job at the State Department. I was still editor of Time, and, and it was kind of a fraught thing, hard to go from one to the other. But she was here, and she knew about it, and she said, you know, congratulations, and, you know, you're going to be great, and, you know, very, very supportive. She was here last week, and she has been so supportive of the Constitution Center. It is wonderful. She's she was magnificent. Fantastic. Chelsea. Yes. So, so cut to maybe six months later, I was, I was in the job, and I'd been in the job like a couple of months, and um, I was back in New York on a, on a weekend, and I got a, the State Department has this 24-7 communications center, and my phone rang, and they, and they said, you know, uh, I have the secretary on the line for you. And I thought it was my boss, Secretary Kerry. And boom, Secretary Clinton comes on the line, and I thought, oh, it's so nice, she's calling to say congratulations. She didn't say congratulations at all. This was about three months after the annexation of Crimea. And she just said, the Russians are killing us on social media. They know how to manipulate their audiences. You need to do something about it. They are writing and lightning while we're st sending press releases. And like hung up the phone. And I was like, wow. She really understood the issue. And part of the tragedy and irony is that, you know, she was a victim of it, um, but she understood that very well, and Putin had a real animus for her that came from, and I talk a little bit about it in the book, in the nationwide elections in Russia in 2011, he, and they had nationwide protests against Putin and against corruption, the biggest protests of his time in office, he said, and he even said after the election, I blame Hillary Clinton for instigating those protests. He blamed her specifically, and Again, I, I don't know what's going through his mind, but, but I, I do think that, you know, I talk about it in the book, that when we first started seeing the rise of this disinformation around the campaign, it was exclusively targeted, not on helping Trump, but on hurting her. And that stayed consistent through the whole thing. It was only after a few months that they started trying to help Trump. So she was onto it, and that's, you know, part of the irony and tragedy of the whole thing. You say in the book that the Russians didn't take seriously the possibility of a Trump victory until the end, like many other people, and that we can't quantify exactly what the effect of the disinformation was. Just tell us more about the influence yeah. on the 2016 election. Yes, I, and I know there are people who um, will say, try to say definitively, yes, it, it won the election for him or it hurt her. Um, in a weird way, we still, even with all the innovations we've made with big data, we still don't really know. I mean, technically, it's an almost a knowable fact, but, but Twitter has sort of expunged, you know, I mean, tens of millions of, of tweets that happened during that time. Even when I was working on the book, I couldn't get my tweets or the, or the, or the tweets that people uh, did to me. Again, I suppose it's discoverable in some way and exists. But, you know, what, the hardest thing in the world, I think, is to, is to try to discern what changes a human being's mind. And so this idea that somehow all of this disinformation that they did persuaded a Hillary Clinton voter to vote for Donald Trump, I, I don't know. Are there 100 of those people in the world? Uh, if, if so, that seems like a lot. What it did, <laughs> what it did seem like they were able to do and, and I write about it in the book, is that they, they, they sought to suppress the vote. There was a tremendous amount of targeting of African-American voters, all of these phony sites that sounded like real sites, blacktivist. Um, they, they rented uh, space on American service, so it seemed like it was happening here. So there's a tremendous amount of, of stuff that seemed to be coming from black activists telling black people not to vote. It doesn't matter who you vote for. They also 
raised the vote for Jill Stein. There was a lot of support for Jill Stein. Again, you know, inference, this isn't proof. In, in the three states that, the three critical states that she lost, um, uh, this one, Pennsylvania, amazingly, uh, Wisconsin and Michigan, the margin, the number of votes that Jill Stein got was larger than the margin of Trump's victory. Now, again, is that proof that it made a difference? It's not, it's a kind of inference. Um, but in, insofar as it had an effect, I think it had an effect in, in that way. Um, I don't think it changed people's minds from, you know, oh, I was gonna vote for Hillary, and now I'm gonna vote for Trump. Just because that doesn't happen. <laughs> and uh, what was the effect of the disinformation around Ukraine, and what was its nature, and, and, and what did you do about it at the department? The reason Ukraine is so important is um, Ukraine is a country the size of France in Europe. It's gigantic. It has 50 or 60 million people. It's a beautiful country. It's the hinge point between East and West, between Russia and the rest of Europe. As somebody smarter than me said, uh, Russia without Ukraine is just Russia. Russia with Ukraine is the Soviet Union. I mean, it was the breadbasket of, um, of, of, of Russia, of, of the Soviet Union. Now, of course, Stalin killed 10 million people in Ukraine with this forced famine called the Holodomor in the 1930s, which is a tragic thing that people don't know about. So, so Ukraine is, is, this, is, a, is, a very, is a gigantically important country. And our whole diplomacy for 30 or 40 years was, hey, guys, lean toward us Europeans in the West. You can't, you know, we're not gonna put you in the European Union or NATO, but we're our natural allies. Don't lean west to Russia and Putin. Now, you know, they've been in and, and at part of Russia and out of Russia for a thousand years. I mean, so when I would go there, it's like, they know the Russians a heck of a lot better than we do. But all of our diplomacy was about, about luring uh, Ukraine to the west. One of the ironies of this whole situation with Ukraine now is this knucklehead, you know, ambassador to the EU, Sondland, who was, uh, was putting together uh, Trump's uh, plan. The reason the, the, the rebellion and the riots and the protests in Ukraine started in 2013, 2014, was they were protesting against Yanukovych wanting to kill a bill that would make them closer to the EU. So here's the ambassador to the EU who's suborning Ukraine to help his boss get reelected. So what's the tragedy of that is it makes us look like such terrible hypocrites when it comes to Ukraine and everything that we've said. And it proves Putin's line to them because it's like, oh, the US doesn't really care about you. They say all these nice things to you and then they'll betray you. I mean, that's been Putin's line to Ukraine for 20 years. So that to me, what, that terrible phone call of the, the quid pro quo is just tragic in a geopolitical way, not just tragic in a, in a US election way. Is there anything else we need to know to understand the phone call, was it just based on the conspiracy theory that the servers were in Ukraine that led the president to do it, or was it part of a bigger battle that we need I to I think understand? it was a combination of the, this server idea and, um, and then investigating Biden. And where the server stuff, uh, I, I actually think that came from Russian disinformation, where the Russians would say, holy moly, you know, everyone's finding out about the IRA. They probably created some disinformation to say the servers were located in Ukraine. I have to say, I, I went, one of my first visits to Ukraine, and I, I think I write about it in the book, um, you know, my, my job was the normal diplomatic thing of like, hey, be more Western, but I was trying to help them with countering Russian disinformation. And I met the, the new information minister, and it was like, I wanted to like, you know, hear all, talk to him about all these sophisticated ways to help him. And, and when I sat down, he turned to me and he said, what is a press release? What's the difference between on the record and off the record? And I thought, oh my God. Um, they're, I mean, they're incredibly lovely people, but, they're, but they weren't very sophisticated in this way. The idea that there's a server farm in, the, in Ukraine was kind of crazy to me. Um, and then the, the Biden thing, uh, you know, that, I, I, obviously Trump did not care about corruption in Ukraine or anywhere. Uh, <laughs> You know, 
one of the things that we, that the Obama administration really did care about. I mean, there was terrible uh, uh, corruption in Ukraine. Happened when, when, from the time they became free in 1991. You know, when you're a satellite or part of the Soviet Union, I mean, which, is, which was a corrupt place, I mean, they don't know how to not be corrupt. And we tried to help them. Uh, Biden was absolutely there as the kind of point person on, on, on anti-corruption. Because remember, the idea of corruption undermines the idea of democracy, which is like, hey, I'm giving you my vote because I trust you, but then you're padding your pockets. It undermines this idea of representation in, in a democracy. That's why we're so much against it. So that's why the call was also so hypocritical, because it was, it was, a, it was an example of corruption that undermines democracy. That being said, well, yeah, okay, so that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> well, that's quite a lot because you've given us a very tangible effect of disinformation, and that's namely this phone call that's yes. led to impeachment. So yes. it has very serious political Well, actually, you know, it's funny. I did an event yesterday. I'm a fellow at the Atlantic Council in, um, in Washington, and they have something called the Digital Forensics Lab, which exposes disinformation. It's really an interesting group. And, they were telling me, and they're going to do a report in the next few weeks about the amount of Russian disinformation about impeachment that they're doing. And even the uh, Senate intelligence report that came out last week, one of the things that was new to me was their assertion that the amount of disinformation that's coming out of the IRA in St. Petersburg and Russia in general is greater now than it was in 2016. Wow. So but it's hidden in plain sight, because you don't know that they're Russians. They're you know, they're pretending to be Americans. Uh, they're pretending to create these organizations. Um, you know, there's an amazing fact that was in the, uh, in the first Mueller indictment. I'm just telling this because people just get their heads explode when I tell you the story. So it was in the first Mueller indictment against the 13 guys from the IRA. Well, they tell the story of how from the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg, pretending to be American Trump backers, they organized a Trump rally in Palm Beach, rented a flatbed truck, hired an actress to play Hillary Clinton in prison garb on a prison cell on the back of the flatbed truck for that rally. And that was done from the Internet Research Agency in St. Petersburg. Wow, well, well, uh, right, that was, I heard that from the audience. Is, is that illegal under US law? Um, well, I mean, the, it is a, I mean, it's a, you know, you can't accept campaign contributions yeah. either in cash or in kind. Um, and of course, the, 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 the indictments were against these 13 yeah. guys from the Internet Research Agency. I mean, they'll never come to trial, of yeah. course, but um, yeah, so they violated U.S. election yeah. law. Yeah. I want to ask uh, to pull back in a moment to talk about the way you think this requires us to rethink the First Amendment, but do we need to put anything on the table about ISIS and the beheading videos and how they fed into disinformation? So, um, you do, what, forgive me, but you do tell an amazing story about our clumsy attempts to counter it with an ironic video showing that it was all a joke, which yes, is one of the clumsiest I, examples of US counter uh, terrorism that could possibly yes. be imagined. I won't tell that whole tale because it's complicated, but I, I'm critical of how we, about how, how government reacts to these things. Remember, I came in from uh, being a journalist and creating content for many years. And, and then suddenly I was in a position where I was sort of supervising the creation of content in government. And it's, you know, it's not a good thing to do. Go you know, people in government don't like creating content. They're not good at creating content. Nobody actually wants content from government. And so uh, I, I say how in, in Washington, you know, if you're against something, you put together a group and you put and you put the word counter in front of it and then you feel like you're doing something about it like you know uh, counter terrorism counter insurgency whatever it is and so we created the counter uh, you know ISIS group we created a counter Russian group and it just wasn't that weren't very good at it and um, and certainly the ISIS guys were better at it I mean the, these sort of digital jihadis they had at one point in the sort of you know the when the caliphate was sort, sort of in existence, they probably had 10 to 15,000 people who were you know, full-time tweeting, you know, way bigger than the Internet Research Agency, and they were pretty good at it. The difference was they didn't pretend to be Americans, they didn't masquerade, they took nom de plumes, but they were you know, 
Ibn Saud or whatever. It wasn't, you know, they weren't pretending to be Betty Sue. And so the, the, the thing that was easy about combating that and where I praise the platform companies is taking down violent content. I mean, violent content it violates the terms of service, beheadings. Um, someone actually, a terrific woman at Facebook, once likened it to pornography, where the, where the image is the crime. You know, the same thing with the beheading video. It's like that, they, they just take that down. And they, and they beefed up, they hired all kinds of, men, you know, hundreds of Arabic speakers. YouTube did a great job, Facebook did a great job, um, and because they could do that. The First Amendment issue was when what people didn't realize that the lion's share of the content that ISIS created was in Arabic, wasn't directed toward us. They actually did more content in Russian and French than English. The harsh stuff was English to scare us, and they, they succeeded at that. But when you see a tweet where, and it shows a, a, a basket of apples, and the, the Arabic legend says the caliphate is bountiful, can you take that down? I don't think so. I mean, that's protected by the First Amendment. It's even protected probably by terms of service. And part of the reason that ISIS was appealing to people is the caliphate is. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a beautiful idea in theory uh, to Muslims. It was Muhammad's idea. And there was a caliphate for hundreds of years. And um, just ISIS perverted it. So that was, that was the difficulty on that end of it. Would you put that in a different category, speech praising the caliphate? Uh, troubling, but it should be left up because it doesn't distort the marketplace of ideas? I, I would. Yeah. Um, um, I would. In fact, um, I, yeah, I, I, I do, I, I write a little bit about it in the book, and you've obviously read it, I mean, where I talk about this idea of the marketplace of ideas as the foundation of the First Amendment. It goes back to John Milton, John Stuart Mill, uh, this idea that in the in the marketplace of ideas, that in a democracy, you know, good ideas and bad ideas, fiction and fact, should compete with each other, and by some miraculous way, you know, the truth wins out. And so I, I say I've become skeptical of that because a, um, you know, there's no particular reason that truth should or would win out. I mean, they also had a kind of religious uh, view of it, which we don't really have anymore when it comes to speech. And that the social media distorts this marketplace. It's not, a, it's not an even playing field like the concept of it is. And that I actually think we need to think about adopting something like some of the European hate speech, hate speech laws uh, in the US. And I, I tell the story of how um, I went to Paris um, uh, after the Charlie Hebdo massacre because we were supposed to help with their messaging. and and. You know, we were supporting the, the free speech rights of these uh, French cartoonists. But I thought, well, let's see, Charlie Hebdo. You know, it's a tiny little magazine. They put Muhammad on the cover two times already. Each time it caused violence in France and around the world. And one, you know, one time it caused like 100 people to be killed in Indonesia. So I'm the editor of Charlie Hebdo. And I think, yeah, I'm going to put Muhammad on the cover again. You know that speech that's going to lead to violence directly lead to violence. Why is that protected? Well, we protect satire, we protect humor, but really, do we protect satire and humor that, that you know is going to cause violence? And also, at the same time, I, the, the other thing that I, I spent a lot of time in the Middle East, and, and there's not, I mean, even the most sophisticated Arab foreign ministers who went to school here would ask me, like, well, why did you allow that minister, that phony minister in Florida to burn a Koran on TV, which also caused riots around the world. Well, the First Amendment protects that kind of speech. Well, it does, but there's, you know, 1.6 billion Muslims in the world all found it incredibly insulting, don't understand the, the free speech protections. And I don't, and, and people around the world look at the First Amendment as, as, an, as an outlier. That idea, the Justice Holmes idea, that the First Amendment is meant to protect not the speech or the thought that we love, but the thought that we hate, which when I was a journalist, I and it was a kind of a First Amendment absolutist, I devoutly believed in, nobody around the world gets that. And it made me rethink it. Um, it's a wonderful idea. 
and it's a, and it's but I'm not even sure it's working in our country anymore. So this is an important place to have this discussion about whether we need to rethink the uh, First Amendment principle in America that, as Rick just said, uh, is based on the Holmes and Brandeis and Milton idea that the best response to evil speech is good speech, and that speech in America, and this is the legal test, as, as Rick knows, can only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence. So go shoot Jeff now. Uh, should only uh, should be banned definitely, but only only if you're likely only if it's intended to get you guys to shoot me, uh, and it's likely to have that effect. Short of that, it's protected. So you're making a, two claims for rethinking that. First, hate speech that's currently protected under that standard you think should be banned as it is in Europe, and second, you think that false news is so distorting the marketplace of ideas that it should be able to be regulated. There are two different claims. First, tell us more about the hate speech claim. Well, why do you, I, and and why, why do you think that Europe, which absolutely bans speech that we protect, uh, are they more effective and do they have less violence as a result? So the, the um, I hate talking about this with someone who knows more about it than no, I No, no, no I, I, I just said all uh, everything I know, but you, you know the rest of it. Um, the, 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 the European speech protections are, I would never advocate that, um, that we should have them here. They're way too stringent. And a lot of them grew out of uh, the Holocaust, where uh, hate spe anti-Semitic speech made the presumption that it led to you know, uh, the killing of six million Jews and, and you know, plenty of millions of other people. Uh, starting after World War II, I mean, Germany, you know, you can't even say the word Nazi. I mean, they have very, very strict laws. France had very, very strict laws. They become more sophisticated. Um, I wouldn't advocate anything quite like that. And the other thing is there's no, I haven't seen any great social science about hate speech, which is the, the broadest definition is, is one person or one group insulting another ethnicity or religion or color or sexual orientation you know, in a hateful way. Um, is there a causal relationship between that kind of speech and violence? I, I don't know. There aren't great studies. It, you know, there's the you know, uh, ex post propter hoc idea that, so when you see one of these killers and you look, yeah, he was reading all of this pro-ISIS stuff online, um, but the idea that that causes um, violence, I'm not sure. But, but the assertion that I make is that it causes that kind of proliferation of that speech undermines the very things that the First Amendment is designed to protect. Due process, free speech, uh, 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 dialogue and debate. Um, and, and so it's like, why are we protecting speech that undermines the very things that the First Amendment is designed to protect? That's partially my, my argument. And again, it's not a, I, I, you know, I'd love to have a kind of scientific evidence that um, hate speech causes violence. That would make it easier. Um, and we all sort of think in an intuitive way that it does, but I also want to be more rigorous about it, too, because, I, because you know, tampering with the First Amendment is, is not something you do lightly. I mean, this is the deepest question of uh, thinking about the First Amendment. And the reason Brandeis and Holmes wanted to protect even the speech we hate, because it was of their faith in time and reason. Brandeis says, as long as there's time enough for deliberation, yes. the best response to evil speech is good speech. You do make a powerful case here that the speed of disinformation is so great that fake news can overwhelm real news, and that part of the argument, uh, as opposed to the banning hate speech, seems to me empirically uh, Yeah, so, I, so I, I, um, I always give my little, people know who Daniel Kahneman is? Uh, just disaggregated for the-, for the Brilliant, group. brilliant. He won the Nobel Prize for, uh, in, in uh, economics, but he's a cognitive, he, was a, he created all of these, uh, the kind of cognitive science of cognitive biases that we all have, and I'll explain that in a second. So, um, so, so one of the reasons that we're in this polarized uh, world is because of what he, you know, his coinage of confirmation bias, which is that we're much more receptive to information that we already agree with, and we 
uh, reject information that we don't agree with. A, a corollary to that is the back, what the backfire effect, which is another one of his cognitive biases, which is that if you have a firmly held belief and someone contradicts it, even with factual evidence, it makes you double down on that belief and believe. So all of these things, like, I'm not sure John Milton knew about all of these things. And, and the other thing is that uh, this wasn't a Kahneman cognitive bias. I, there's a terrific book uh, by a, a woman social scientist, and she coined this term um, belief echoes. So all of the social science shows that even if you, in order to rebut a false statement, if you present that false statement, like most news organizations do, and then rebut it and say, you know, Donald Trump said, you know, uh, he's not withdrawing soldiers in Syria because, you know, it's a bunch of sand, and, and he's lying about this and wrong about this, that initial false statement resides in your brain. It creates a belief echo, which never is expunged, even by the true information, even true information that comes immediately after it. So it's like, you know, that ain't a good thing. And so, and I used to run a news organization, and, you know, but I'm kind of more of a partisan now. And so it would be like, I would say, to undermine this false belief, I wouldn't ever state the false belief, I would just state the true belief. So, so there's, a, you know, in the, in the Twitter world, which I also live in, you know, there's a lot of controversy. Some journalists say you should never retweet a Trump tweet even to uh, disabuse people of it because it will, that information lodges in people's head, and I actually think that's right. And the surveys show that fake news travels further and faster than real news because people are more likely to click on clickbait and share it without reading it if it has an explosive headline than they are a thoughtful, yes. true piece. So this is a real problem. We know that from that data. And then you give this very powerful, specific information about disinformation in Ukraine in the 2016 election, which, as you just uh, showed, may have led to the current impeachment. Now let's talk about solutions. The distributors of the disinformation are not the government, but the platforms. And the platforms are not bound by the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law, not Mark right. Zuckerberg shall make no law. So the, the platforms could, if they choose, adopt any, any strategy they like to uh, slow down or stop distributing real from fake news. How can they make that distinction? What do you think they should do? Well, here's the reason they don't, and uh, uh, is that um, the primal sin of this new environment is, was the Communications and Decency Act of 1996 that helped create these platforms. Um, people's eyes glaze over when I say... No, it's really interesting. Communications <laughs> and Decency Act. No. But, um, and tell them about the section that's really exciting. Section 230. <laughs> <laughs> you set me up for that. Absolutely. Section 230. Stop, stop. stop. Um, but basically what that did, and it was actually a wise law at the time, Legislators saw these new platforms that are different than any other publishing platform in human history. Why? Because they use user-generated content, and they make money from selling user-generated content, your information and, and, the, and the stuff you post, you know, like of your grandkids or whatever. So they wanted to incentivize that. So the way they incentivized it is they said, you don't have any liability like an old-fashioned publisher for the stuff you publish. In fact, you're not even a publisher. Well, you know, it did create this gigantic industry. But you know what? Facebook is not only a publisher, it's the biggest publisher in the history of the world by a gigantic margin. And just because they're not publishing professional content by journalists that's fact-checked that fact and lawyered and all of that, doesn't mean they're not a publisher. This is a new form of publishing. So I make the argument that they need to be given some kind of liability for the stuff that they publish and particular types of things that they published. You know, uh, demonstrably false information. That's, this is the news today. I mean, my, Mark Zuckerberg gave that speech at Georgetown or wherever, where he said, this is political speech. Even false statements in political speech are protected by the First Amendment. We're not going to take it down. I, I, I think that's a disingenuous argument. I think, I think they need to take down however we define hate speech, demonstrably false speech, uh, deep fakes, which, are, which there's no benefit to, and, and they need to have a li liability for that. They can't have the same liability that I had at Time Magazine, where every word that was published, if I made a mistake or defamed somebody, I could be sued. You can't do that because we're all putting up all this junk anyway. But, but 
content that violates those principles, I think, should be taken down, and they should be liable if they don't take it down. Europe does not have. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> <laughs> Europe does not have Section 230, and the platforms are liable for a version of demonstrably false statements. Is the statement of the Ukrainian server demonstrably false, and could Facebook be sued in Europe for publishing it? And is there less fake news in Europe because of Facebook's liability in Europe? All good questions. I, I certainly don't know the answer to the last one. I, um, I would love to know. Um, part of the reason that they don't take content down is because they don't want to make editorial judgments. Right. Because if they make editorial ju judgments, people, you know, even guys in Congress who you know, still are on AOL will go, oh, you're a publisher. <laughs> and, um, and therefore, you need to be responsible. So, so I, I find it sort of disingenuous when they don't, like the Nancy Pelosi video, of, you know, uh, the kind of so-called cheat fake. Like, I mean, they didn't want, I, I would argue that Facebook didn't want to take it down because they don't want to seem like they have an editorial function as opposed to they know it should be taken down. Um, I, I do think, I mean, and I, I read uh, the, uh, some of the Zuckerberg's remarks today, and, and what resonated with me was do people want technology platforms making editorial decisions about what's false and true? That, to me, is a legitimate question. It's like, well, I don't know if I really want that. Um, so it's a, it's a murky line. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want them deciding what's false and what's true. But if there was, a, a, you know, if they, ha if they had a third party mechanism of a board to, to look at content and make decisions like that, and that was you know, participated in with other journalist organizations like the Philadelphia Inquirer and the New York Times. I mean, to me, there's a way to come to a kind of consensus on this where it's like, yeah, that idea that, there's a, that the servers in Ukraine, that is indisputably false. Can't repeat it. So Facebook is proposing to create a kind of Supreme Court for Facebook. And I gather they're going to outsource it to law professors and journalists and ask them to make the decisions. But this is an age where the- Did he say that today? No, well, that, that's this is, in the past, it's, right. it's in the air, and they're yeah. going to try to, because they don't want to make these decisions at all. Yeah. They're eager to, have, to give it to a third party. But as your book shows, this is an age where the distinction between real and false news is so contested that even the claim that the Ukrainian server is false would itself be contested. Is there any group in America that could actually have the authority and trust to make those distinctions in this age you describe? Well, you know, you know, one of the things that's so pernicious to me about the, you know, Trump's fake news hypothesis and you know, enemies of the people is that traditional journalistic organizations make those decisions a thousand times a day, right? Nobody publishes something in the New York Times or the Washington Post or the Philadelphia Inquirer thinking that it is wrong and it has been fact-checked. If it's controversial, you know, the uh, general counsel looks at it. Uh, the, you know, as a writer, which I was for a long time and still am, I'm personally liable. Like, like this idea that Trump says journalists are making stuff up, it's like, it's like every journalist who makes something up, I mean, they're personally liable for it. They'll lose their career, they'll lose their, you know, their bank account. I mean, if you get sued. So, so people don't understand that's how it works. So people are making those judgments. They're not always right. You know, that's the distinction I make between disinformation and misinformation. Disinformation is deliberately false stuff to deceive you. Misinformation is, like, for better or lack of a term, it's a mistake. And so we make mistakes all the time. But I guess I would rather, in, given the world we live in, have a situation where, where professional people who make these judgments will occasionally make a mistake in the pursuit of what is fact versus fiction than nobody making a judgment about it. And, and, I, and, and, and to your question about the server, like, I don't know that that is I can't say with 100% certainty that that's false. I, I don't know. That distinction between deliberately false information and mistakes is helpful and might be enforceable, and I gather is enforceable in Europe. So then the empirical question would be in Britain, for example, where it's more easy to sue over disinformation. Does Facebook take down more stuff, and is that effective? They do, actually. So. Um, um, 
Um, I'm an absolute advisor to a tech company, Snapchat, and so I do a little bit of public policy stuff. So, so yes, so there's content which are on all of the platforms in the United States that's taken down in England or France or Germany. Um, um, and they are, they're, they're stricter. And the, and the tech companies observe that because that's their business model. I mean, uh, you know, they observe it in China, which is another whole area of discussion. I mean, look at what the situation that happened with the NBA in, in China, uh, where the business model of these places is, is to comport with, in some cases, the repression of free speech, which happens in China. That's not, that's not in England where they take something down because it, you know, it, it's insulting an ethnic group. In China, they take it down if you are critical of China. You know, that to me obviously is a bridge too far. The NBA example reminds us that all of the pressures are in favor of takedowns from authoritarian governments to market pressures from people who don't want to hear these hate speech. Given those countervailing pressures on the other side, might that make you rethink the value of the traditional American First Amendment model? Yes. I mean, in the, one of the other themes of the book, I'm now just going to piggyback on that, is once upon a time, in, you know, if we go back to the Cold War era, the way authoritarian governments and autocrats operated was they restricted the flow of information, right? So, so this model that we had of free speech was, well, we want to get people in the Soviet Union to understand that you know, we have a free society. Those cultures restricted the flow of information. True and factual information was a scarcity. What autocrats now are realizing is, hey, not only can I combine restricting information with, I can start putting out the information myself on social media. So, so you know, Putin and Erdogan and, uh, and Xi in China are not only kind of repressing speech in their country, they're creating false speech and disinformation uh, for their own people. So, so you know, I, I went to Russia uh, at the end of the administration and, you know, and I'd spent a lot of time thinking about it. I mean, you know, the reason Putin has a 84% popularity rating in Russia is because all of the information that Russians get, it comes from state endorsed media. That's like, that's the kind of media that Donald Trump would like too. Um, and it's not like they can't watch CNN or get hold of CNN and the New York Times, but they're not interested. They, that's like they believe state-sponsored media. And so one of the interesting studies that Pew, Pew's done fabulous research in this is that, you know, you have, you know, I'm, I'm really overgeneralizing here now, but people around the world trust their state media, mm -hmm. even if their state media is authoritarian and represses speech and represses a point of view. They trust it. So. Uh, in all of these countries where you know, autocrats are popular, it's because they've, they've restricted outside media, they've pumped up uh, their own media, and, and people are, are relatively you know, happy with the status quo. And what can be done about that? Well, you know, the idea of the internet, you know, the, like John Perry Barlow's statement about the internet in 19, you know, 96 or whatever it was, is this idea what, that was, it was a democratizing force, right? That people would have access to information and to go back to the, you know, the Miltonian idea is that when people have access to information, the truth rises. And people have more access to information than any time in history by an exponential margin. Um, but it hasn't quite had that effect. I mean, I still think that the, on balance, by a gigantic margin, the benefits of the internet outweigh the, the problems. But I do think in the sort of group mind that we're living in now, people feel like, well, no, the internet is the source of all of our problems. Um, but the manipulation of the internet is the source of a lot of problems. I, I don't think, I mean, the internet is neutral in, in, in that sense. Someone asked me the other day, and I, I, I'll ask you this question. Uh-oh. <laughs> they said, in, in, if you look at the ratio of disinformation and misinformation to correct information in 2019, do you think that there's more disinformation relative to the entire supply of information than there has been other times in history? It must be the case that now we have on the internet all of the knowledge of the entire world. It's so thrilling to think of all the learning that exists with digitized books and all of the greatest recordings of 
music, overwhelmingly it must be the case that there's far more truth than falsehood, I would imagine. I, th you know, that's my presumption. The difference, and as, as I started thinking about it, um, was ac e easier access. So let's say you believed in a conspiracy theory that the Martians landed in New Mexico you know, in, in, in the 1950s. Well, man, I don't know where you would go to read about that. You'd have to find some strange bookstore and haunt libraries and look up stuff. It would take you years to find even one tiny bit of information. Well, now you just type in Google, like, when did the Martians land in New Mexico? And you'll find it all. I don't know if there's more of it relative to the supply of, of you know, true information, but, the, but access is easier. Access is easier. There are no gatekeepers. There and no it's gatekeepers. harder for the people who are not uh, literate with the, in the sources or familiar with the sources to distinguish. In the old days, not so long ago, when we were both full-time working journalist. Time was an authority. The National Enquirer was gossip. Now it's all melded together. Is that, I is, forgot that you used to write for Time when I was there. I wrote for I, Time I, and I wrote for yeah. other places. And yeah. I, it was great to be a journalist in the 90s because there were five magazines. And if you were in, uh, that was great. And now there's uh, I had no to pay papers. you more because there was that You, you had to pay very serious money yeah. in those days. It was excellent. Um, one of your solutions for this reason is media literacy. You do think that distinguishing between true and false news would be helpful? Well, so um, I've actually thought a little bit more about it since I wrote the book. So that seems to me there are some things, look, it's, I'm not a truth absolutist in the sense that, you know, the truth doesn't come underlined in yellow. You know, the, the, we have to make judgments about it. But there are certain things that, that the platform companies can do. So for example, is that tweet from a bot, a machine, or is it from a human being? They, they know the difference. That every user needs, needs to know that. Um, remember, advertising and your information is the source that, that makes all of these companies immensely profitable, right? I mean, when you think about it, you don't pay one penny to have a Facebook account. You don't pay one penny to be on Twitter. You don't pay one penny for the greatest search engine in human history. But you pay because you're giving them your information and you're looking at advertising that they're sending to you based on the information they have about you, right? So when you like Google, uh, you know, black loafers, you know, suddenly you'll start seeing ads for black loafers. Well, why is that? Because Google knows you're interested in black loafers and that you're more likely to buy it, particularly if it get, gets repeated. So one of the things the platform companies need to do, I think, certainly with political advertising, and the Honest Ads Act says this, but I think in all advertising, which is like, I want to know why I got this ad. What information that you have about me that I got this ad? Why, so why am I receiving it? And I, I would argue that a, a greater transparency, even among companies, is good for that company. It's like, well, I, I, you know, we like to buy things. So maybe it's not a bad thing that I'm getting an ad for you know, NBA tickets or something. I'm interested in that, but I want to know why I'm targeted. And so th there is legislation to do that for political ads where I think it's absolutely indispensable, particularly, you know, it's not legal for a foreign country or person to buy a political ad, but you have to know the genesis of the political ad, why you've been targeted, what information they have about you. And I think, I think that kind of more transparency for everything would be, would be a, a boon. Wonderful. I'm monopolizing the conversation because it's so interesting. We have some great questions, as always, from the audience, and here's the first one. So what is the role of the U.S. information agency in this, and what is it doing to counter public disinformation against the U.S.? The U.S. information agency? Yes. So that's from somebody who's probably of my generation or older who asked that question. <laughs> yes. Uh, the U.S. information agency doesn't exist anymore, and the... the um, this is not, it's so esoteric, but the, the legislation that created my job, Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy, also uh, got rid of the U.S. Information Agency in 1999. The co-sponsors of that legislation were Joe Biden and Jesse Helms. Hmm. <laughs> uh, and so, so the parts of USIA became part of the State Department and became under the U.S. became under the undersecretary. So one of them was the IIP International Information Programs that was part of 
uh, USIA, and some of USIA went to something called the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which was international broadcasting, which is Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Free Asia, all these names that we've sort of forgotten about but that actually still exist and have an $800 million a year annual budget. So, um, but when people ask that question, it's usually from the framework of, well, we used to know how to do this in the days of Edward Murrow and, and the US and USIA. That was during the Cold War, and, and we did sort of know how to do it, but as I was saying before, that was an era of scarcity. And it was just about how to get information to someone who has no information about the United States or democracy or voting. And now they can get access to that information, they just don't want to. So, so I think that's a harder problem. How would you characterize disinformation in China? What's, the, what's their grievance? So one of the things, um, and actually the, the Senate Intelligence Committee report said that there's been a greater amount of disinformation from other actors besides Russia, in particular China and uh, Iran. And, and so some of my information is out of date. But so we looked, we looked at what China was doing. And it was interesting because China's entire focus of disinformation or propaganda, which I, I'm, I, I think is a more morally neutral t term, uh, was internal. China's fantastic. You know, Xi Jinping is the best leader in human history. Uh, you know, be happy, our you know, GDP is 11% a year. It was mostly internally focused, and insofar it was externally focused, it was also about promoting China to people around the world, the kind of stuff the US Information Agency used to do. Um, so China was not, a, I, I thought, a, a disinformation threat to the US. Again, that may have changed in the, la in the last three years, but I also think that you know, the, chi the Chinese are, are what, what was a big threat then and now is stealing intellectual property. They're the best at that in the world. Uh, corporations get attacked thousands of times a day by Chinese hackers, but that's, that's what they're after. Uh, they're not after, you know, persuading people to vote for Joe Biden. Uh, beside voting the party in power out of office, how should citizens respond to a mis-disinformation campaign engaged in by our own government? So, by our own government. Uh, yes, I call Trump the disinformationist in chief in the book. Um, you know, one of the points I make is this idea that we don't have a fake news problem, we have a media literacy problem. The problem is that people are not equipped, don't have the tools to, to figure out the difference between fact and fiction or the provenance of information and where it comes from. And, and, and we need to teach that. I mean, that's a long-term solution. Um, you know, the, 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 the complementary part of it was something when I was here, when Sandra Day O'Connor came on the board and she said to me, like maybe even on stage here, like we're going to pay a terrible price in this country for having stopped teaching civics 40 years ago. Well, we're living in, in that world now. And so I, I actually think schools need to teach media literacy. People make a distinction between media literacy and digital lit literacy. I would say you need to teach both. And one of the proposals that I've been thinking about is the tech companies should pay for it. You know, they should pay billions of dollars a year for, to school systems to learn how to, to, you know, to do media literacy and digital literacy. That would be, that would be a, a, a good penalty, I think. This is a, uh, the last question I need to ask. Uh, could the Constitution Center play a role in a media literacy program, and what would the program look like? Well, um, so some combination of civic and media literacy, and I think, and they're certainly related, I mean, because as, as you know better than I do, this idea of information was central to the founders, I mean, in the sense that uh, you know, governments are instituted among men deriving their, their just powers from the consent of the governed. Well, how is the consent of the governed achieved? Through information. You know, Jefferson would say you can't have a country that's ignorant and free. Uh, you know, Madison's idea about it, you can't have you know, a popular government without popular information where it ends up as a fraud or a farce or both. I mean, they, this was so intrinsic to their idea of how democracy works because it was based on everybody making a choice and you make that choice through having information. So I think 
to me, the Constitution Center could play a very valuable role in that intersection between media literacy and civic literacy because, because our democracy depends on it. I couldn't say it better. For the former chairman of the National Constitution Center, please give your thanks. Thank you. That was great. Yeah. That was superb. Well, I'll sign it. Please. So, actually